All right. Exciting. Yay. Thank Hello. you for having me. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's RD to RD Live. I am excited for Diane to be joining us today. She's going to be talking about her book, but before we get into that, a little introduction and background from me on the live show. So since November, I've been hosting a, first it was monthly, and then we've been going weekly for a number of weeks, um, a live interview with a fellow dietitian, dietetic technician, or another expert um, who either has a digital product that they've developed or has skill in a, an area of you know, development. We had um, Louisa on a couple weeks ago about Facebook advertising. We'll have someone coming on about digital marketing and video. So really the intent of the RD to RD live show is to bring knowledge and wisdom to um, the RD to RD community and um, answer the questions that you have. So today we're talking about developing an ebook. I hear all the time um, a lot of our community members um, want to create an ebook. And so Diane recently um, published, self published her own book, and we're going to talk about that book. Um, and we actually, I think it's funny, we're doing this Zoom interview and we're literally just a few miles from one another. Um, we both, we live actually pretty close to one another and we've met in real life, which I think is always um, fun to be able to, to, to meet in real life, not just over social media. Um, so Diane, can you tell us a little bit about your practice, Health Takes Guts, which I, I love your branding and I love your name. <laughs> and I know you specialize in functional nutrition and gut health. Talk to us about your practice and then we'll start talking about your book, your background, a little about you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, my background, it makes more sense if I tell you way mm -hmm. back, short, long story short. Yeah. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was 18. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of is the reason why I went into dietetics, although I didn't find a lot of help with conventional dietetics for myself. But over the years, um, I was professionally enjoying being a dietitian, but I was also, uh, my health was going downhill personally. And then a few years ago, five years ago or so, I was like fed up and I was like, there has got to be more. And I discovered functional nutrition and I was like, this is it. And I absorbed everything I could. It was just great. I mean, I read every book I could. I took every seminar, every webinar. I, I just um, loved it. And I, felt better. I transformed my, transformed my own health and I started using it in my practice and my patient outcomes went from night to day. So it's all, it's just great. Um, it's, it's exactly what I was always looking for. It helps fix the root of the problem instead of just muting symptoms. And if we, you know, address the underlying cause, all kinds of wonderful things happen. So you're, you've practiced primarily with, um, gastrointestinal gut diseases is, um, is that um, kind of the basis well, so of your practice? Because you have a private practice. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So uh, originally, I've been in private practice for 13 years, and originally I did mostly weight loss and high cholesterol and things because that's what that's who found me. Um, in the past five years or so, now that I've switched to functional nutrition, I've become more focused in my branding and what I do. And so, yes, I am a gut health expert and that is mainly where I guess my patients, you know, fall, but I also do a lot of other things. I brain, you know, anxiety, depression, ADHD, um, fatigue, chronic fatigue, uh, hormone imbalances, perimenopause, pretty much anything. Cause once you start getting into functional nutrition, they're all tied together. The gut is tied to everything and vice versa. So, I do a lot of that stuff. I don't do eating disorders, but I do pretty much everything else. I help people with all kinds of issues. And then you have a special certification in um, functional nutrition. I'm not, um, I'm new to the world of functional nutrition. So what is that certification? Do you recommend it? I always love when you have people on to talk about what that is and yeah. um, what it's done for you. So it's um, IFNA, the Integrative and Functional Nutrition Academy, and they, um, I was already practicing functional nutrition when they sort of opened, but I was like, oh, I need this. I need A, a certification, so it's not just sort of self-taught, and B, they're much, it's much more well-rounded. It's not just about gut health. So I did, I went through the, right away, their first sort of 
that was the, one of the first people to go through. And so it's a certification. It was about a year and a quarter. And um, I have a diploma and I have a letters after my name and it's great. It was great. And I do recommend, if not, it's great. It's very thorough and it's a lot of time. If So it has to be something you want to do. Mm. Good to good to know it's uh, at least one you've you found valuable in your practice. And I and I actually really like that you talked about so many, you know, you've been in private practice a long time and you started out in one and then you really you already had this passion from, you know, your diagnosis of Crohn's disease and that you've settled into kind of this work that one, obviously you're deeply connected to, and two, that you enjoy doing. And I think, you know, it's really fun to talk to someone who's had that journey, been down the path and has settled into what really feels good. For those of us that are still figuring it out, you know, it's okay to take anything and everything and eventually give yourself time to develop um, your expertise. And, and it's not going to happen in a year. <laughs> no, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's a, you just articulated it perfectly. I do feel <laughs> deeply connected to what I do now and it is more fulfilling than what I was doing before, but you can't rush these things. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk about your book. Um, I love the title. And um, Health Takes Guts, Your Comprehensive Guide to Eliminating Digestive Issues, Anxiety, and Fatigue. So let's talk first. I want to go back. We're going to talk about the journey, like how you, how you tackled writing a book. But before, tell me, who is this book for? And um, really, what does it contain? Kind of like a big 30,000-foot view, and then we'll start digging in more. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, who is it for? It is actually written for a sort of a, a lay person who is sick. And so it's educating that lay person on like something that they wouldn't already, that their doctor wouldn't have told them. And I'll talk, we'll talk about what that is, but you know, microbiome and, and gut health and the root of problems and how to fix them. But I also think it's for RDs. I mean, this is the exact book that I would have wanted myself personally and professionally five, 10 years ago. So it's very comprehensive. It has a lot of info in it. I think RDs might actually appreciate it more than lay people because sometimes lay people don't want to hear all that technical info um, and the case studies and all that. So it's for both uh, sick people. I hate that word, but you know, people who aren't feeling well and also professionals who want to learn more about functional nutrition in the gut. It's a great resource for that group. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've read your book it's great. And I think the way, you know, I'm not an expert in um, functional nutrition. I think you put it really well. It's the resource that you would have wanted to have, that it's this big topic that maybe I'm interested in as a professional, but how, where to start? Like you, t you've taken this incredibly complex topic and not just, you know, like, I don't know what it is, but you've digested it and like, what do you do about it in words that make sense to someone who hasn't had any exposure yet? You're talking about really complicated things in a way that's like, oh yeah, that's easy to understand. And I just think it's clearly you were meant to write this book because it's really, um, I read it and I'm like, oh, I am in for this functional nutrition. Sign me up. Like it, the, um, you're just, you're a very talented writer. And so I want to, um, talk about how you did, I mean, obviously you blog and, you know, but how did you decide, okay, um, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to self publish. Talk to us about how your journey started. Yeah. Um, so basically, and we'll get back later to how you really have to be passionate about the topic. Mm -hmm. But first I'll just go back. Um, I do write a blog, but I don't really consider myself the greatest writer and I don't write in the blog consistently like some bloggers do. But what happened was three years ago, some publisher from England found my blog and actually approached me and wanted to hire me to write a book about this kind of stuff. And I was like, Oh sure. Great. And I got very excited and they paid me to do a synopsis, like an actual sort of chapter outline, um, table contents and synopsis. So I did that and it was very invigorating. I really loved it. And then the book didn't actually go anywhere. We didn't make it. It wasn't written. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, so I've kind of been, since then been like, I kind of have a book in me, don't I? Uh, and I sort of turned that synopsis into actually a webinar that I was giving dietitians on Dietitian Central. So that's part of what happened there. But what happened about maybe a year ago, maybe last summer, was I realized I was very, very busy in my practice and something had really shifted away from like, where am I going to get my clients and how am I going to 
figure out what to do for my clients. It shifted towards, okay, all that's figured out. I'm busy. They're coming in. I know what to do. What's next? And it's not just what's next like for growth, but also what's next, you know, can I make a little more money without working harder? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do two things. One was to hire a dietitian to work under me, which I have done. And the other was to do something that I could sell to make some passive income. So I was like, okay, I could do a course. I could do an ebook, you know, yada, yada, yada. And basically the ebook is what felt right. It just felt right. That's all I can say. Like it felt easier than anything else uh, for me. And this was the topic, you know, because this topic might not sell as well as something about weight loss, but this is the topic that I was passionate about. This is the topic that I could write a book about, because this is a real, it's a long book. It's not mm -hmm. 20 pages, it's 135 pages. So you gotta like know a lot about it. You gotta like your topic. So this was the topic and um, there was no question about that. And I guess I decided in September, all right. So this is like last September, like yeah, less like than a year ago. ago. Like, yeah. yeah, like very recently. Yeah, <clears throat> this all happened rather quickly. I don't know how to explain that. But yeah, September, I was like, okay, ebook time. And um, I'm, a, I'm a doer, like, a, like I'm, I'm sure you are with your business. Like, so once I set up mine to do it, it was like, all right, I can't, I can't not do this and I can't have it hanging over my head. Let's finish it tomorrow. Um, so I worked on it steadily in the fall. So when you say you worked on it in the fall, so when you made the decision to write and you decided I'm going to self-publish, right? So when you're going to write a book, you've got a few ways. Like you'd already had this interaction with a publisher and um, that didn't work out. How did you say, okay, I'm going to write an ebook and I'm going to sell it on my own um, and do the publishing myself. How did you make that decision? Well, so basically the idea of finding a publisher and dealing with all that was, it seemed impossible almost actually. Um, first of all, it didn't work three years ago. And so why would it work now? But I, my, my husband actually wrote a book and he even had an agent and they couldn't find a publisher for years. And I was like, I'm not dealing with all that. Yeah. Like, it's just, there's no uh, resistance between you and just putting it out as an ebook between me. You know, there's no, there's no stopping me. There was no one stopping me. And if it didn't sell because I didn't do it right or because my topic is, too common well then that's my problem but i could still publish it i could still write it and i could still publish it so uh, i felt like finding a publisher would be an impossible task i wouldn't even know where to begin and i pretty was pretty sure nobody would buy it yeah and what were some of the things when you went into okay what were you a little bit nervous of you're like okay i'm gonna publish this myself and you know i know we talked a little bit about this was you know, a bit, sometimes we call these passion projects, like how many people have to buy this? What, what made you a little nervous as you went into, like in, back in September, what were you most nervous about? I was very nervous about some things. Um, I was very nervous about, I don't remember actually, but I remember being very nervous and you have to expect that and deal with that. I was very nervous about putting myself out there. Hmm. You know, here I am, I have this little business. The business is great, comfortable, why not just stay small? Um, this is like, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to put myself out there. And I don't know, what if someone doesn't like the book? What if someone doesn't like me? And it's like, now I'm like, okay, that's fine. It's, I just, but at the time I was like, ah, very nervous about that. I was, um, I guess I was nervous that it wouldn't sell, but I also came to terms with that because I was like, well, this is what I'm writing. Um, but it's also just nerve wracking to be like, oh my God, this project is so huge. Yeah. And that's like, how do you, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, I have this aspiration of writing a book someday. And so I'm thinking of myself as you back in September going, okay, I'm doing this. And you're six months later and you, your book is incredibly well written. It's beautiful. I mean, everything from like the little graphics to like call outs of text and sidebars. I mean, it's really pretty. So to get from there, you know, from six months ago till now met, you had to create kind of some kind of a work plan, some kind of a, okay, so I'm going to do this first, or did it just kind of come together? And I feel like sometimes we get, I can't start until I have it figured out how I'm going to go from point A to point B. So let's be real and talk about, okay, this is how I actually did it. And it worked just fine. So let's hear it. <laughs> yep. So that's good. So I actually didn't start doing anything for about three weeks because it was like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? 
is can I market it? And so I actually did think about marketing first, which mm. I just kind of thought that way, but actually I think it's very smart because if you don't have some kind of marketing plan or some kind of marketing idea, then it's you're going to end up with this book that's wonderful that no one's going to see. Mm. So I'm glad I thought of that because it kind of made me feel like, okay, I, you know, that motivated me a little bit. And, you know, I got some advice from people like, yes, you should make like every Tuesday is your book writing day. And I just didn't do that. I'll just be honest. I just didn't do that. I basically wrote when I felt like it, which was maybe Sunday afternoon, maybe for an hour on a Tuesday morning. Um, I, I did block, I keep saying Tuesday because I did block off Tuesdays. I no longer scheduled clients from October on, on Tuesdays, but I didn't, I ended up exercising or going grocery shop. I mean, I just didn't end up spending all day Tuesday writing, but I did spend some time, some Tuesdays writing. I don't even know how to explain it, but it seemed to just happen. Mm -hmm. And I work, I personally work better that way. If I wait until I'm motivated, um, instead of being like, okay, it's nine o'clock, let's go. It's like, okay, I feel like writing today and I want to get this section done. And the other thing I did, it was an outline mm -hmm. because otherwise I don't think I could have done it. So you have an outline, which is sort of like your table of contest. And you're like, okay, I'm going to write the part about estrogen today. I'm going to write the part about stress tomorrow. I'm going to finish this whole part one by Thanksgiving. So I didn't have a, you know, a set schedule, but it was like a, something that kept me going. And you just chunked up based on your, your outline, um, getting the writing done. And then I know you did a ton of work over like that holiday season, um, really just yes. mad writing. I did. I finished it on December 30th and it was, I, I probably did a huge amount that week because my, we were, I was at my in-laws and my kids were in ski school. So I stayed home while they went to skiing and I wrote every day and I, I don't know, I can't remember, but I, I'm sure I wrote maybe a quarter of the book that week. Wow. Something. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was like, I want to get this done. Anyway. So you did the writing and then, um, you had to figure out. So one of the things is, okay, I can write the content, but then it needs to be in a, like a nice format, right? For people to, it has to look good. Um, yes. and I, and I want to, I love that you just made it happen. So let's talk about how you approach formatting your book and, um, what you learned. Uh, Cause I think we, we could all, um, I know I would like to know more. Yeah. 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 So, um, I had a vision. Like I was like, okay, I want it. I want it to look similarly to how it came out. I wanted to have, you know, a colorful like a border. I wanted to have sidebars. I mean, I even wrote sidebar in the document when I was writing it. Mm. Now I want this to be a sidebar because it doesn't really flow with the text, but it needs to go here. And um, I had this vision. And so when I was writing the book in the document, I was writing directions to the designer that was coming later. Mm. And I wrote sidebar. I wrote put this in color. I wrote, put the outline around this, et cetera, et cetera. And then what happened was I was planning on maybe finding an ebook designer and paying them because I don't know what I'm doing, but I had an intern who was with me in December who knew a lot about Canva. And I said, well, can you make me the cover? Because here's what I want the cover. Here's the picture. Here's the title. Here's the font. I don't know what I'm doing on Canva. Can you make me the cover? And she did. And it was beautiful. And I was like, huh, and I can't remember whose idea it was, but we, we kind of figured out we could just do the whole book on Canva, which we'll talk about. Um, and so she started, like I had already written the introduction at that point, I'd already had the introduction edited. So I had her start putting the introduction into Canva so that while she was my intern, she could be starting. Anyway, so I did it all on Canva. And after she wasn't my intern anymore, I paid her to help me and I did some of it. I actually paid another person to help me because Canva took forever. Mm -hmm. Part of the, you know, don't use Canva. Yeah. Um, but it do, it does look exactly. It's just it's beautiful. It, it looks like I wanted it to. Canva was did it did it, it worked fine. So yeah. So um, I think that element of how are you going to easily because there's you know editing a book like every time you change page numbers or you you adjust something everything's going to get moved around and I know. Um, you can't know, to do it yourself. Exactly. And there's some programs that make book formatting easier or that people who do book formatting obviously would have access to. If you did it again, would you, would you find one of those people or would you just power through again on Canva? Or I would not use Canva again. 
for this. Let me tell you, it was the worst part. I mean, and slow like, oh. and really slow, right? And it wasn't just so slow. It was like you'd put the cursor somewhere and the cursor would show up somewhere else. Yes. And I, so I actually had to proofread this thing like 17 times because letters were missing in the middle of words that I didn't actually erase. Canva did it. And oh my God. And it was the most, this was January and like, I was like, I cannot believe, like it was so stressful. Yeah. So I would not use Canva again. I would use Canva again for two page things or yeah. three page things. Or maybe for your cover, or if you had to do a cover design yep. or something. Exactly. I mean, right. I have an 18 page little ebook and it is so slow when I try to make edits to that, just 18 pages. So I'm trying to envision, I mean, I know you had to make multiple. So I think we've just advise that if you're going to create an ebook more than a few pages, mine's 18, that you probably either need to break it up or find some other. <laughs> well, I had to break it up into six parts because Canva only lets you do 30 pages, but that was okay. I had six 30 page things. That wasn't the problem. The problem was how slow it was. Right. And you're absolutely right. Yeah. If I changed one thing on one page, I had to go change it on all the pages because it doesn't just automatically Right. Now I, I, re, I did the page numbers on that thing four or five times. <laughs> yeah. We have a comment here from Gore and she says, I use InDesign. So I think that's, you know, a Excellent. tool that people could um, look to. But I think the reality is if you're committed to making something happen um, that, you know, lessons learned, but that it shouldn't hold you back from, you know, now your next book. <laughs> when you write oh, one. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, I've gone way off way off topic of my questions because this is super, super fun. So we talked a little bit. Is there anything else you want to add on the organizing tasks and time? So, you know, you, it sounds like your own personal style that you did dedicate Tuesdays, but, you know, you were a little bit flexible and you wrote when you felt the urge and it just came out. Like it yeah. just flew out of you when you were ready to write. Yeah, kind of. And that was, but I, I that is what happened. So that, that to, to share my story, that's what happened. But I think it, the idea of putting aside time is a wise idea. And I think maybe from the angle of when you're busy with whatever work you're doing and you're taking on writing a book, I think mentally going, oh, but knowing whether or not you use your entire Tuesday, but you know, at least you're mentally going, I have time to do it. Yeah. You know, yeah. maybe helps. Yeah. Yeah, Other than this. No, it, it did. It was all good. Plus, having a one day where I wasn't back to back to back with clients, even if it was just doing other things, was nice to take that stuff off my plate. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so besides the actual writing part, I always think it's interesting when we talk about digital products. We put all this focus on the product, and that's like a tiny bit of the work. All that other stuff is honestly just, I mean, when we had... Heather Neal launch was like, yeah, it's about 80, 20, like the product's 20%. Everything else is like 80%. So I'm sure you had an editor. I'm sure you had some of this other stuff. So let's talk about besides the writing, how did you, what other aspects of self publishing a book should we, do we need to tackle? Yeah. Well, we, well there's the design, which we've talked about, but that's mm -hmm. a huge thing. It was huge. I couldn't believe how sort of much work it was. How much how time would you say like percentage wise after you, had the actual manuscript, like you had all the notations, like, hey, call out or sidebar or color or this. How much well, time? So you mean hours or you mean like? Well, just like percentages. I mean, okay, so you get that done. That how? What percentage of the work was still left after yeah, you actually had huge. it written? It Quote. was so much. So okay. Much. The design was just so much. And I don't know, because there was three of us working on Canva and it was hours and hours and hours of all of our time. And you know, just, you have to keep going because you're not going to start over and I don't know. Anyway, yeah. so there's that. And then, then there's more. There's, you know, the shopping cart. How are you going to sell it? Oh yeah. yeah. We got to talk about that. The sales page, the yes. writing of the sales page, the making of the sales page, the shopping cart and the e-junkie and the checkout process and, and then the marketing. These so, are all huge parts. So let's start with, let's talk about this sales page and the shopping cart. So, you know, I've published a few blog posts and, you know, eJunkie uh, you know, is an option that's popular. There's DPD, eJunkie, you know, Send Owl. There's a ton of different options, Gumroad. So how did you decide to use eJunkie and how did that work? Did that, you're selling it on your website, sales page, just talk us through that. 
Yeah, so I didn't know that much about these options. You, you know a lot more about these various options. Heather Neal knows a lot more about these various options. I just I had heard about Eat Junkie and it sounded perfect. It's, you know, it's relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. They do a shopping cart. They do an affiliate program, which I knew I wanted. So it was like, great, let's just do it. Like, I don't have time to research, you know. And I had my assistant, like, make sure that, I don't know, it had good, like, operational ratings or whatever. And she dealt with that. Um, so that's how I picked eJunkie. I don't have a huge, I don't have a lot to say because I just picked it. Um, but it's it's fine and it works it works very well. The sales page, I just you know I looked at a lot of other sales pages for a lot of other eBooks and I just got kind of like a sense of okay you got to put the benefit. I mean I already know some of this from my just marketing trainings, but you put the benefits on there. You put why they should listen to you on there. You put like what they're getting on there, what they're learning and. I am quite pleased with the sales page. I'm not a salesy writer. I wish I were better at it, but I, I'm quite pleased with the way the sales page turned out. And I did have a marketing person look at it after I wrote it and changed a couple things, but it's, it was It's great. Yeah. We should think, link to that. I'll link to your sales page so people can see oh, it too, because okay. it's not easy to do. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, and it's, so I'm pleased with it. I was very intimidated by that part. I thought, Oh God, I mean, I, I even procrastinated on that. I like let that go for a few weeks, which doesn't take a lot of time, but it was a lot of time because everything else is ready. Yeah. Um, so I just was like, I don't know how to write a sales page. I don't know how to do this. So anyway, I, I wrote the sales page and then my assistant did the web design and she did a very nice job. And I said, well, actually put this picture here instead, but she, she did a very nice job. And, and then we did the e-junkie thing, which she did a lot of this. I don't know quite how, I think she spent quite a bit of time like figuring out, I don't know how to put the settings in eJunkie and yeah, and I think we should stop to make sure everyone listening, everyone might not be as familiar with. But eJunkie is a shopping cart. So when, you, when you sell something online, you can either have a shopping cart on your own website, which makes you comply with all sorts of rules around you know selling, or you can use a third party, which they take care of letting you connect up your payment processors and delivering the file after purchase. So basically, when they go to buy the ebook from your website, while they click on add to cart, it's a it's a button on your website. When they actually go through and purchase it, the purchase is actually done through eJunkie, and then eJunkie delivers the PDF, the, the the download to the customer, and you pay a fee for that. Um, so you can have access. So there's a ton of different options out there, um, but eJunkie is one of them. It's very popular. So make sure everyone yeah, knows. <laughs> no, you did you did a great job. That's right. So eJunkie does the. Uh, the payment, but PayPal too. I don't quite know. Yeah. Well, they they, yeah. you have to connect, you have to have your own um, payment uh, accounts with like PayPal, PayPal. or anyone, yeah. Stripe or whatever. Yeah. Um, but otherwise on your own site, you need to have all of the payment going on. And if you don't want to deal with that, then eJunkie will take care of it. Well, I like that eJunkie has it all and they deliver it and they deliver three emails, like yeah. two to the client, one to me, you know, and then I get an email from PayPal as well. Um, and, and I really recommend that. One of the ways that I've seen people um, with a digital product, you know, I've seen people put it on a password protected um, page or, you know, just give a link out to it in the email. But honestly, you don't want people sharing, you know, unauthorized sharing of your file. And most things like eJunkie have settings where it'll say you can only download it for a certain number of times or the download links only valid for a certain amount of time. You know, that's your that's your blood, sweat and tears, right? You don't pay. I mean, I think eJunkie is five dollars a month, five dollars a month, five dollars a month to yeah. not have to deal with. Well, I'm going to upload it and give the purchasers a link and the th it just a lot of some of these also let you PDF stamp, which I don't know if eJunkie, I can't so remember. eJunkie has a, has a unique stamp on every yeah. single book. So if people share it, yeah. I would know. Yeah, Probably they do. I can't stop them, but I would know. <clears throat> no, but just like when you, I mean, back in college, you would download a journal article, the PDF would say what library it was from. So if that gets shared, it says Megan Boitano purchased this and when it gets shared, if it pops up somewhere else, it goes back on me that I, I didn't follow your licensing terms. So it was not intended to be distributed to other people. And then you can kind of hold people. So I really am a firm believer in using some kind of digital resource management um, that some of these allow rather than just 
Oh yeah, you know, it was five bucks a month, and it's perfect. It does yeah. everything I want, and it does the affiliate thing. Which it has I really, affiliates too. I, need, which I needed about. that too. We'll get to, but yeah. So yeah. It, e Junkie's great, but I can't say that it's better than anyone else because yeah. I don't know that. But it's great. I'm very pleased with e Junkie. It's perfect, but. But we had to set it up and I, I chose two, like you were saying, you only allowed two downloads. It does have the stamp on it. Um, I also wrote the, the email that says, thanks for purchasing, by the way, don't share this. Yeah. But I think these are all things that you're like, oh, I'm going to sell an ebook. These are all of the other things. You think the hard part's going to be writing the book, right? Well, it is. But then yeah. there's all of these other little things. I remember when we met a while back, we were talking about images and licenses yes. for images. Yes. So I think just to back everybody up, if you, let's say, grab, buy an image, a stock image, a license, that's not, you're not buying the image, you're buying the rights to use the image. You can use it in your promotional materials. That might be a social blog. media post, a blog. But if you're going to put it in a book that you're then selling with a price tag, uh, some of that's in violation of some of the licenses. Or you have to pay like a $100 extended license fee. So yeah, you I have images in your ebook. So yes. you're not a, I'm not saying you are a lawyer, you know what's going on, no, but, but you I had did. to I figure it out. I did. It was you had to figure it out. You're absolutely right. That was another piece that I did not anticipate. And I was very stressed out about and I talked to you about it a lot and I spoke to my lawyer I mean I don't know how much time I spent with him but he charged me for it and I searched through Adobe's website and I there was all these different because uh, I have an Adobe subscription that I pay for so I get to use their images and there are several different places on Adobe's site where they say what you can use and what you can't use in the terms and the terms are slightly worded they're slightly different so it was like, oh my God, this one says I can use it in ebook. This one says I can't. So I'm very comfortable now. I've dissected it. I've had the lawyer look at it. I think it's fine. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But it was um, nerve wracking. And I recommend, you know, using your thing because you know they allow that. A digital. I digital think deposit photos deposit is explicit photos. that you can use the standard license in eBooks. At least it was the last time. And I think it's really important when you're selling, whether you're selling a workbook, a handout, uh, yeah. anything, that the second you put a price tag on it and you're selling that, that you could be violating the license terms for the image if you're using any kind of stock image in that. So to make sure that you, do you have the rights to put that image in a for sale product? You may not. So yeah. um, knowing that in advance. <laughs> in advance. Yeah. In advance. Okay, I'm all off time. I'm going to regroup back here on my question list. So, uh, marketing. Marketing. <laughs> yeah, marketing. Oh, yeah, back to that. So, you know, you spend a little bit of time in advance thinking about marketing. So, what you thought about and then how it's actually gone. So, tell us how long it's been since you launched your book and how you, it's not been very long. So, how did you, how did you do all this? So, I launched the book on March 1st, which was fine. Um, meaning I didn't know if it was going to happen at the end of January because we weren't even done with the design, but it happened. It was fine. We scrambled. Um, the sales page, I, I just want to point out again, is your first piece of marketing. It's got to be good. Otherwise it won't convert. And I don't know what a good conversion rate is. Mine is converting. Okay. I have no idea if it's good or bad. It's, it's, I think there's still a lot of people who aren't, who are visiting the sales page, but not buying the book. And I find that interesting. I don't, I don't know if that's normal or mm -hmm. what. But what I, what I have done is I, I, I post about on my blog an announcement like that just about the book. And then I've been posting, I've been blogging every week with little excerpts from the book and saying, if you like this, buy the book. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much the blog posts have done, but that first announcement got me a bunch of sales from mm -hmm. my followers. You know, I have, I have quite a few, not quite, I don't know, again, it's a relative number, but I have uh, 650 or so on my blog. And then I have, you know, hundreds of Facebook and Twitter. Da, da. So I, I sold from that that way. That's great. So was That's that your initial plan going in? You either, you have to have an audience to sell to. Was this your primary plan going in to say, I have people who rave about me who would buy a book from me. So I'm going to pick up some sales here. Is that well, kinda... I knew. I definitely, but that's not enough. Yeah. I mean, if you want to, that's not enough to actually make any money. And again, it's not even about making money as much as breaking even because mm -hmm. of how much I spent on this book. <laughs> but um, I knew, so I'm just saying that's the first thing is the announcement on my blog, my social media page and so forth. And then like a call to action on all the past blogs, all the future blogs, that's all good. And then affiliates. I'd say affiliates are the big thing because other people have audiences who could benefit from this book and other people 
can do this for me and they will get a commission. So I have uh, a lot, again, a lot is a relative term, but I have quite a few people um, who are affiliates. Uh, some of them are actually these generous souls who aren't even taking a commission. Like I have a supplement company who's, you know, posting it and not taking commission. I have a, uh, like a yoga studio who's doing that for me and so on and so forth. And then I have a bunch of other people like other dietitians or this acupuncturist who has a, a very popular like wellness center. Um, I'm pointing down the street. Yeah. Anyway. So how did you target? Did you just go anyone and everyone or how did you decide, okay, these, you know, how many affiliates, where to spend your time as far as selecting them. And then obviously communicating with your affiliates, you had to, I mean, send them their affiliate yep. link and all that stuff takes time, time. and organization. It does. And, it does. Wow. Um, I basically am saying anyone and everyone, because why not? It's a win-win for everyone, for the people who are getting the book, for the people who are getting the commission. And for me, it's all win-win. Um, but I didn't just sort of say, hey, everyone come get me. I, I, I emailed the people that I thought of. I made a list of like the people that I know that would have good audiences who wouldn't be offended if I approached them. Um, and there's mostly people I know. Like I think the other idea, and maybe later, maybe now, is to approach people I don't know. Like send some emails to some big big bloggers and say, you don't know me, but I have this ebook and it's wonderful and you could make 50% commission. Why not? Yeah, so and how did you decide on your commission percentage? Like, how did you research that and come up with, okay, this is the number I'm going to use? Yeah, that's a good question. I, again, it's like the e junkie thing. I kind of just, I'm, a, I'm a, an affiliate for other people. So I was like, 50% seems to be standard. I don't want to be cheap and go less than that. So I just said 50% is fine. I'm, I'm getting the benefit of their audience. They've built their audience, so they deserve whatever. And um, it's just passive. You know, anything they can give me is a benefit to me. So it's 50%. It's great. So, yeah, anybody wants to promote my book to their audience, you can get 50%. <laughs> yeah, you become an affiliate. for. Yeah, you can become an affiliate. Yeah. So it's, it's good. But I just thought of people I knew, and I thought of people that have audiences that would like it, which means both lay people and also dietitians. Mm -hmm. So you had, we didn't talk about having an editor. So I know this is a big component when you write a book, you know, I, you know, I've done some reading and it's like, you absolutely need to get an editor and you need to listen to them even when it makes it hurt a little bit. <laughs> they may not always tell you what you want to hear, but that's their job. So right. how did you approach having an editor for your book? So the, I, <laughs> I used my husband's editor and how did he find him? He's local, lives down the street. We've never met him face to face. This this guy, this is what he does. He's an editor. He's an editor. That's what he does all the time for, um, he does it for academics, like editing their research articles before they, I don't know. He does a lot of it. That's all he does. So I contacted him in the fall and, um, you know, he doesn't, he charges very reasonable. Again, I wouldn't know what to compare to, but so he edited the book. So what does that relationship feel like? If you, I'm new, you know, never written a book before. It kind of seems a little intimidating. So I'm going to give them my work and then they're going to chop it all up and send it back. What does that process feel like for you as a first time author? And well, it does. It feels like you're sending your baby out into the <laughs> cyberspace. Um, he could steal it, but you know, that's just, they, he's not going to do that. So I sent him in chunks that way he could be doing it while I'm writing the next thing. And I could give it to the designer while I'm writing the next thing. So he would use track changes in word, which I actually didn't like cause I couldn't turn them off. So when we put them in Canva, the track changes were still, I mean the whole thing. So that's another thing I wouldn't do again, but he did track changes and a lot of it was just commas and, you know, split infinitives and grammar. And that's great. That's fine. And then a couple of times he did say things like, well, you know, this doesn't make sense. Um, but most of the time it was commas and grammar and perfect. That's what I wanted him for. So that's what he did. And then I had my husband read it word to word. He's a very good writer. He's a good writer. Uh, I had my father read it cover to cover. And he's also a stickler for these rules. And I'm so glad I did because they found lots of stuff that the editor missed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God. And it was the kind of thing where at some point you just stop because I'm sh I had my father read it a second time and he found things again. Mm -hmm. so I was like, oh my God, should I have this? Should I do this a third time? And I finally was like, you know what? I can't take this anymore yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's good enough. But the point is, is that it's never done. You know, yeah, because you had, 
you know, starting out with the marketing and then doing the writing. And then as you're writing, you know, you're sending off those chunks um, to, you know, the, the editor. And then yeah. obviously when you're getting back like the final, you're going to be handing that off maybe to the designer yeah. to start, you yeah. know, getting it set up in, you know, you use Canva, but whatever. Yeah. There's a lot of, you're managing a lot of these pieces, especially on a, a timeline. And then you're also course you started your sales page and all of these other things it's a lot of um components it was it was very stressful and so i had all these people and i have i had an assistant who by the way i i'm so grateful for but there's another person like who everybody's working on their own timeline and i'm like eager you know i I have to ask because this is a topic that comes up all the time is this the cost thing that we are always bootlegging right or was like i'm just gonna do it myself that all the things that we've talked about they have uh, they've cost oh. you a ton of money. Like we've talked yep. lawyer, we've talked designer, we've talked editor, we've talked, you know, all of these, these components are costing you money to create this book. And I think, how did you mentally go, oh my gosh, I'm making this big investment. And what if nobody buys my book? How did you know that I just need to put this money out? Because how did you know you had to? And how did you get over the fear of I'm, I'm spending all this money? Um, I mean, that's a good question. <laughs> I was, that was part of what in September I was like, oh my God, the work, the money, um, the investment. I guess part of the reason I stuck with it is because I had already invested so much money. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, this is happening. You know, I'm not giving up in the middle, not when I put all this time and money. But how did I get over spending so much money is a hard thing. To, I don't know. It was slow. It was slow. Yeah. You know, it was like, you know, $200 to this person, $100 to that person, $500 to that person. So it wasn't all at once. But you're Did right, you budget, up. like, as the costs, you know, did you have an idea of what it was going to cost going in? Or was it really pretty much a huge surprise to you that how much that it was going to cost to create? I didn't have any idea how much it was going to cost. And I just but I was willing to invest to make it better. I didn't want to, I definitely wanted an editor because I'm not, I hadn't thought of my father and my husband, but I didn't want to be the one editing. I'm not a good editor. I, I, I was okay paying a designer or in this case, my intern, because I just, I'm okay with paying people for good help. Like I'm okay with paying people who know things more than I do in, in whatever way they know. Just like I'm now, only now in my life, comfortable accepting money for things that I do well, you know, and there's no guilt. And they, these people do what they do well. They deserve to be paid. So I had no problem with that. And I, I thought that was a wise thing to do. I had no idea how much it would add up to be. And my assistant who works, she's a virtual assistant. So if, if she works for me for one hour a month, I pay her one hour a month. If she works for me 40 hours a week, I pay her 40 hours a week. So mm-hmm. I did not anticipate how much I would need her mm-hmm. and how much I would have to pay her. I just didn't know. So that just about the book. She just did so in February alone. It was unreal. Wow. So um, I didn't know going in how much it was going to be. I just kept doing it. You just keep going. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I think there's this temptation to, um, you know, maybe do as much. we can. I think we want to do as much as we can ourselves, but to acknowledge that there's certain things that we're not good at. And, I, and I'd love Imagine what your book may may look may have looked like if you hadn't made those you know investments and um, it's a great product. Um, I I think um, it's very inspiring to hear you that you know I think oftentimes we read blogs or we hear from people and it's this you know, this is how you're supposed to do it. We go to a webinar or, and they tell you, this is the ideal process that you should follow if you're going to publish a book. The first thing you do is X and Y. And then you talk to people who've been down the process, like, yeah, I never did that. And (laughs) and I really, really, really want these weekly interviews to like pull back the, you know, stuffy, boring slide deck. This is how you're supposed to do it and tell stories. Like this is what my first ebook looked like. Yeah. You know, maybe I wouldn't use Canva again or, you know, I didn't know how much I was going to spend, but that's okay. So that people who are, you know, watching and hearing don't feel like, well, I I can never start because I can't follow the stuffy slide deck process. That's just, it's too intimidating. And then it's okay to just figure it out as you go. (laughs) It is okay, but you do have to want to do it. Like it's so much work. Yeah. Yeah. So much work. So... 
I guess, what advice do you have? So imagine, you know, you're sitting down with someone who's like, okay, I'm passionate. I love this topic. Cause for you, you know, when we talked that you had a, started having this thriving practice around, um, you know, gut health, functional nutrition, you were seeing the kind of clients you wanted to see. And you're, you were like, I want to help more people. One, my, you know, I'm full, like I'm booked up and I can create a passive, right? Income source with a book. I can help more people. And I think that's the great thing about digital products is it allows us as registered dietitians to connect on a broader scale, on a broader scene. But how would you say to someone who has that same burning desire, right? They've developed this expertise in their area and they're just dying inside to create something to help more people. Like how, what advice do you have for them? Well, I mean, I think the first piece is, is what you've already said, that they need to have the passion and the topic that they're passionate about. Um, because this is what this is. I, I'm deeply connected to this topic and I speak about it for eight hours a day. I speak about it all day long. People respond. People say things like, I saw 10 doctors, no one can help me and you help me. So it's like, I need to put this in a book, you know, and I want to put it into a book and I like writing about this topic. Let me tell you, I wouldn't want to write about gout or something like I just, I wouldn't be able to do it. So this is a topic I enjoyed writing about. I speak about it all the time. I would actually keep a little notebook next to my desk. Like if I gave somebody a little piece of advice, I was like, I got to put that in the book, you know? So, um, there's that, I think that's huge. In my opinion, like I just think that's huge because I personally would not have been able to write a book about a topic that I didn't care about. Just for the money, I mean, forget it. So, um, so pick your topic based on passion, I think, rather than saying, well, I see a lot of people asking about X. I can make more money if I write about this topic versus what you're really right. deeply that, connected to. Correct. And a lot of business people would say what you just said. They say, you find out what your audience wants and you give it to them and that'll make you more money. And that's, I mean, that's fine. I, I, maybe that works for some people. That would never have worked for me. That's all I'm saying. And can um, you do both? Can you do a little bit of both, right? Of course. <laughs> I hope people want my book. I mean, that's yeah. the idea. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, thank you. Um, so other advice, um, I guess just to, well, to manage your, um, to, to not expect it to be easy, to manage some of your fears, like the fears that will come up. Don't let them stop you. Because um, sometimes that can be like, oh, I, I can't deal with this anymore, I'm gonna stop. And it seems to happen like at the beginning, at the middle, at the end, you're like, oh, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And it, you just gotta keep going because I could have given up and I would have been like, I wouldn't have judged myself. I would just would have been like, it's too much, but you just keep going and look at that, oh, it's done. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how does it feel to be a published author of a, of a book? It feels good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it feels I imagine great. that moment of like sitting in your shoes and being like, Rah! you know, just so excited like, about out there. And yeah. It's, it's but your point it's you made about putting yourself out there, I actually think about, you know, it's one thing to see clients and get that immediate interaction, but to put your knowledge out there it makes you feel really vulnerable that what if what if people say this is garbage and what if people don't like it that this is like especially when you're writing about a topic you're so passionate about like this is your heart and soul that you put into this book and how scary that must have been to it's wonderful but it's still scary right very that's what I dealt with in October I was very scared about putting myself out there. I felt very vulnerable. I was like, I don't think I can deal with this vulnerability. I don't think I can deal with people's possible criticism. And I don't know why that went away, but that has gone away. Um, maybe because I'm just so, just so done. Like I'm so glad it's done. I feel such a sense of accomplishment. Um, it's, it wasn't like a light switch, like, Oh, I'm done. I feel accomplishment. It was, it was gradual feeling like that because there's no done. There's all this promotion. There's all this work. There's all this, I have to write, thing for for this affiliate and that thing but at some point around march 1st i was like oh you know no more talking to the assistant like 17 times a day no more worrying about the canva no more like will the book be good will the book look like i want it to look will the book be written the way i want it to be written i mean that was all in october can yeah. i write this the way that i think it can i write this the way that people will be able to hear it it's all done. Yeah, I think that point about managing your fears and just accepting it, I I use the analogy of kind of 
you know, entrepreneur's yoga, if you want to call it, that that discomfort of growth that I think of it like yoga, right? That where we're uncomfortable, but being able to kind of settle in to that discomfort, breathe and move forward that sometimes at the end, that d- discomfort is so worth it. You think of the end of your, you know, your yoga class, how amazing it feels, but you had to go through holding some of those very uncomfortable poses to get there and that it's okay. Just settle in, take a breath and, yeah. you know. Um, well, I also move. feel like, I, A, I'm okay if people don't, if some people don't like it. That's okay. That's okay. They are, that's totally okay with me. It's okay. And I, too, I'm not, I just don't see why anyone would get that worked up in order to bother me about that. Like they don't like it. Okay. Why would anyone care enough? It's a great, it's a great little book. You don't like it. You don't like it. I don't, I don't know why I was so worried that people would come trash my house. Cause I wrote a book. They don't like, you know, no one cares. Do I mean, you have any it? plans to put it on? Cause I put it on Amazon or other more um, broader. Like what, what's your next step? Because we're exactly. running out of time, which always happens. It's so much know, fun. Right? What's so, next for your book? And then tell us where people can find out more about your book. Yeah. The next step is um, create space through mm-hmm. Amazon um, or Ingram spark. I have to look into these things. It, I'm procrastinating because it's intimidating because it's like I have no idea what to do. But that's that's happening. It's going to happen. That's next. Um, because Create Space is this great thing where they'll print it on demand. So I don't have to pay $10,000 for them to print all these books. They will just print it as people buy it. And I don't think I get very much money. But so what? It's on Amazon. <laughs> um, that's perfect. And that's that's definitely next. I might actually also, there's this book baby or something where you can actually pay, like I might print five or 10 copies. Like I have a bunch of people who want me to sign them, you know, and I, I would love to have a copy, you know. Oh yeah. To do like a, oh, that'd be really interesting to sell copies. Yeah. So you think you'll put it in a print form as well as just a, a um, electronic ebook? Well, create space is print on Amazon. Right. So I'll do that and okay. it'll be, I just don't know how that works. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure you, I have no doubt you'll um, be able to, you'll figure it out. And I think that's part of it. It's just, you know, figuring, figuring things out as you go. The answers will you'll figure it out. It's like Canva, you won't do it that way again. <laughs> exactly. So tell us how people can find out more about um, Health Takes Guts, the complete guide. <laughs> well, it's on RD to RD. Mm-hmm. So you can find it there. It's and you can find it on my website, healthtakesguts.com. That's my homepage, but there's a link to the book on the top. There's a link to the book in the sidebar, and there's a link to the book in the footer. The page for the actual sales page is harder to memorize because it's healthtakesguts.com slash HTG ebook or something like that. Yeah. So it's better to just go to my website and then click on one of the places to find it. Yeah, um, and I definitely encourage, I mean, one, your sales page, you know, that it's a great chance to to look at that um and get some more details about the book so um i've really enjoyed you know i think um i really enjoy these conversations because they are intended to be you know real and answer questions that um come up and um you know that you don't have to have you don't have to have it all figured out to get started and that you know, if you're passionate, if you're deeply connected and you want to make something happen that you can, but you also brought in the expert. So you didn't try to be your own editor and be your own designer and be your own lawyer and be your own. You can't like it, just doing all that yourself is very difficult. Not to say you can't, but that the product you created, I think, um, is probably a big reflection of, you know, the fact that you did make some scary investments, right? Some money into it. Probably into the also, book. Um, it also happened faster mm. like I if I was doing all myself I'd still be fooling around with Canva right now mm. like I'd still be like dealing with e junkie I don't know you just it happens a little faster because there's a team working right yeah I think um Amber Gorley from Dietitians and Virtual Practice, she always says, you know, when you and make an investment, you changes how you show up for your business, right? That when you've spent some money, it changes the perspective of yourself and also of the product, that it makes it different and you see it differently. And I think um, when you do make an investment in the editor, you're going to show up, right? You're going to show up and get that 
you know, you, you spent money <laughs> yeah. making that investment. So I always think bringing in those nuggets from people who are wise in mindset. <laughs> So, all right. Well, um, thanks again for coming on the live show. Again, we are every Wednesday at one o'clock here on the RD to RD Facebook page. And then these videos, if you always figure out you miss them and you're watching us on replay, which many do, they get loaded on the uh, my, Google, my Google, my YouTube channel. And if you subscribe, you'll get a notification every time I post a new video. So you don't have to worry about scrolling through Facebook to um, find the latest video. You'll just get it delivered right to you. So that's another great option if you want to stay on top of our weekly live interviews next week we are talking with um, Kristen Schaefer she's a yellow brick nutrition and she's going to talk about listing images so she sells on Etsy teachers pay teachers RD to RD but she creates the most beautiful little um like puts your digital product in a real life environment and she creates all these beautiful listing images for the various platforms that she sells on. So she's going to break that down and kind of give some tips. So excited to have her on. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining and thank you Diane for uh, thank you coming so on. For and uh, yeah, check out your book, Health Takes Guts. There's a link to the um, sales page on RD to RD. Um, also you can visit uh, Diane's website, healthtakesguts.com. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm.